this is going to be a great session on Jeremiah, predominantly, I think, because when I was preparing for it in the last couple of years, I always get fresh revelation, and so therefore I've got something exciting to talk about, which is good, right? Um, so we're going to look at Jeremiah. Uh, we're going to get right into it. Hopefully you'll get something fresh. Not only will you get a personal revelation, but you'll get some insight in how to understand and read the word just by the exercise of what we're doing. That's one of the things... One of the main objectives of this course is not that I say something amazing and you go, wow, I didn't know that, but that <laughs> through the process of it, you start to I, I adopt for yourself a way of reading and understanding the word. And that's the main goal. So we'll just, we'll just get started with Jeremiah. Um, this is a very important book. Um, it's a big book and there's lots in it. So we're going to get right into it. Yes, here we go. Here's a quote. I love this quote. The book of Jeremiah is long, complex, and difficult. To the modern reader, it appears to be a repetitive mess, a mixture of poetry and prose in no particular order, but containing traces of attempts to collate and give order to some parts of the material. The reader who is not confused by reading the book of Jeremiah has not understood it. Uh, it's from a, a commentary on Jeremiah. Now, that's a great way to start. Um, be encouraged if after you've read it, but you're like, huh, I don't get it. It's okay. I love it. Um, that's just part of the package. But don't be scared of, shouldn't cut us off. We shouldn't be scared about it. We should still get right in there and see what we can find. So we're going to look through. Some of it is going to be like, you'll find very quickly, some of it's repeat of what we talked about before, but other stuff is going to be new as well. So let's just have a look and see what we can find. Well, we'll start off with the themes that you're going to see over and over again. Um, no surprise here. You're going to, he's a prophet, so it's going to be um, highlighting sin and judgment and calling people to repent. In particular, in Jeremiah, he's going to talk again and again about hard, stubborn hearts. How the people have got hard, stubborn hearts and they won't repent. Hard, stubborn hearts. That's one of his things that um, is strong through Jeremiah. You're going to hear about the sovereignty of God, not over only over individuals, but over nations and kingdoms. And um, very strong in the book of Jeremiah, God is sovereign over everything. Nothing happens without His say so. He pulls the strings on the whole world. Very strong in the book of Jeremiah. Also, he's a strong prophecy of the restoration of Israel, the new heart that God, the new covenant, the new shepherd. This is another strong thing that comes through in Jeremiah. So despite the fact that the leaders that Israel has now are bad and are failing in their mission, God will send a proper shepherd who will be a good shepherd, a good leader. And we all know who he's talking about and what that's about. Um, the other thing is Jeremiah's example in the trials. He has a hard time, um, and we see a lot of his personal walk and how he's coping with it, um, and that's an example for us, for the readers. It's how we're supposed to respond when we go through hard times as well. So let's look at our favourite timeline. Um, we might just start from the very start. I have one person highlight something from each session just because we could. So I'll start at the bottom of my screen. And we're looking at creation. Bottom of my screen, fear of me. Tell me something about what are we referring to? Important things in that creation box. Uh, creation is the creation of man, Adam and Eve, the yep. um, relationship with God and the fall of man as well. Fall of man is pretty important there. That's right. So Genesis 1, Genesis 2, very early stories. Excellent response. Tavi, Abraham, what's important about him? Uh, Abraham, the um, covenant that, um, not the covenant, the promise for Abraham about yes. um, the... very important. God made a promise to Abraham, and what was the promise? Many children. That, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Anything else? The promise. Um, Many children and... Land and blessing. Land, yeah. land that's yeah. right. Yeah. Prosper and blessing. And come, you will come back. You're a nomad now, but I will give you this land. Very important for our Old Testament understanding of what the people in the Old Testament, what they're thinking. Egypt. What's that about? What happens in Egypt? Who must speak? Oh, Joe, you can. You're next row up. Here, go. Okay. Go. Joe, I must go. Okay. Yeah. Yep. In Egypt, um, so Abram and his everyone moved across to Egypt because there was a famine. Yep. There was about 70 of them. So they were 
there was pretty many, but then during the time in Egypt, they ex uh, got more and more descendants and they grew yep. and grew and the Pharaoh got uh, nervous. So he <coughs> enslaved them and, um, yep. and they were there for, I think 400 years. Am I right? Yes. yes. And, um, and then they cried out to God and said, please help us. So God raised up Moses and um, Moses, and in that time, Moses warned the Pharaoh about letting the Israelites go and he ignored them. So God sent a whole bunch of plagues and problems to them. Yep. And the Pharaoh just said, no, pass. And he let them go. <laughs> and so they left Egypt and they went into the wilderness. Great. That's Egypt and Exodus covered. Very good. Um, Sinai Covenant, what is that referring to, Sheila? Is she there? Are hey, you there? Yes. Sorry. Uh, uh, Sinai Covenant. The law. The law, that's right. Given to them on the Mount Sinai, so Ten Commandments and all of that stuff. Yes? Yeah. Um, wilderness, Cosmo, what's the wilderness referring to? Well, the 40 years where they rejected what Lord was doing, so he wiped out a whole generation to raise the next one to go into the promised land. Exactly right. So they, they didn't reject God for 40 years. They rejected God at the moment they mattered, and that resulted in them um, wandering for 40 years. That's right. Okay. Um, covenant reaffirmed. Everyone just moved. Uh, covenant. <laughs> that's really confusing. Shemitai, uh, covenant renewed. What is reaffirmed? What is that? Uh, since they'd broken their covenant with God after the Ten Commandments, this was yeah. another covenant yes. to reaffirm that they would be God's people and God would be theirs. Yes, so standing on the border of the Promised Land, we have the book yeah. of Deuteronomy where Moses goes through all again, and then when they cross through the river, they do the Sabbath and they do circumcision and they start afresh um, to try and do this thing right. Okay, Promised Land. Promised Land, Kuma. Oh, yeah. Moving into Israel with Joshua. Joshua, that's correct. Okay, Judges, oh, Sue. Yeah. What is Judges? What happens in the book of Judges? Uh, they, they, um, they're the ones that um, they, they judge, they, um, oh, I, I'm trying to think how to put it. Uh, the military. What was that? More military. military. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they um, they brought in the law, they, they, um, yeah. So the judges were leaders in localized areas who yes. drove out the enemies and invaded them. Can we, can you name, name one of the judges? Gideon. Gideon was one of the judges. Yes, yeah, Samson yes. was a oh, yeah. judge. Samson, uh, Deborah. Yeah, was, yeah. Um, there's quite a few of them there. Um, Gideon, Samson, Deborah, those are the, probably the most famous ones. Yes, okay, Kings, what? What happens in the period of the kings? That covers Samuel, Kings and Chronicles. Mm. Caroline. Um, so the Israelites wanted a king to rule them and yep. Samuel ap appointed a soul um, yep. yeah, to be the first uh, king. So he anointed him and um, yeah. Yep, and be the king of Israelites. Yeah. Who came after that? Um, Is it a there's an important point to that, though, I think, Derek, that I was reading today is that although Saul, I mean, Samuel um, anointed Saul to be the part king. He wasn't yes. a full king. Yes. He was a part king and a ged or chieftain. But the one thing is that God <clears throat> actually, the people wanted a king, not necessarily God. So, you know, Saul was appointed, but at the end of the day, he was, it wasn't really God's first choice. Is that Correct to it's, say that. it's a complicated section of the Bible because at some places it says, you know, the people wanted a king, they've rejected God as their king and wanted a man to be their king instead. And that was a negative thing. But yeah. at other places, it appears that having a king was inevitable because the judges thing wasn't working anyway. Uh, and God has chosen and this set Saul was the one chosen by God. So he um, was, even though he was still the one appointed by God. They did the pray and have a have a raffle, a lottery to see who's <laughs> king, and they trust that God will guide the thing, right? Spin the bottle, and if that's how they made decisions when they had nothing else to go on, um, and they trusted that God would do it, and God laid it. And remember, the Samuel called to him and prophesied over him and all stuff. Yeah, it happened, and it was all God. God was in it. Yeah, but it's 
it appears that it wasn't God's best um, at the time, but it's a little bit of a complicated thing because there's two sides. Rejecting God because you want a man to be a king like everyone else, yeah. um, but God was still sort of was in the king movement as well because he talked about it in Exodus and stuff about what the king should do and things like that. Okay. So it is a little complicated thing. There's like two thoughts going on at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was kings. Who came after Saul? Uh, David. 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 And who came after David? Solomon. 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 That's awesome. Okay. So that brings us to kingdom divides. And that must be a glorious turn. Kingdom divides. What's that all about? Um, so that's when um, they decided that. Israel and Judah would be split and they'd be yes. separately. Yeah. How, why did they do that? Um, I can't remember right now. <laughs> yeah, so Rehoboam. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, that's <laughs> right, wasn't friendly. Yeah. He, uh, the yeah. people asked for a break from all their hard work and he said no. And so the um, 10 tribes split off and said, we've had enough of this. Who wants mm -hmm. to follow David anyway? We're out. Yeah. And that was a split in half. So we have the north called Israel and south called Judah. Awesome. Okay. Cycle of apostasy. Ben, what's oh that? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Give you the big words, mate. <laughs> oh. I, does anybody know what apostasy means? Because I actually Googled it today. Well done. Um, I don't know what that means. Apostasy means the walking away from, the withdrawal from. So basically in this thing, it's about the walking away of the ancient Israelites, walking away from God. Turning That's right. God. Exactly right. So, yep. that, so exactly. the cycle of apostasy... Um, they have a king who is good and they follow God. Then they have a king who is bad and all the people turn away. And they go in a cycle like in Judges where they follow God for a while then they turn away and bad things go bad and they follow God again and then they turn away. Same cycle that we saw in Judges mm -hmm. happens. Um, generally speaking, in the north, the kings were always bad. And in the south, they had good kings and bad kings sort of taking turns. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically it. Okay, exile of the north. What does that mean? Uh, Narelle. Good question. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, some country invaded somewhere and Assyria. sent everyone away. Assyria, Assyria invaded the northern kingdom, which is called Israel or Samaria, and exiled everyone. Once they conquered the country, they sent all the inhabitants, except the very poorest, away into other countries. Totally disrupted them. Um, that weakened people's ability to ever fight back because they were all scattered and some of that. So that was what they did. Um, then we had. A renewal? What do we think renewal might be talking about? This would be Ian, who's off the screen. Is he actually there? No, he said it's not. Jayden. Okay, that's right. No worries. I haven't done... Uh, Faramy, have I done Faramy? Uh, yes, he did. I did? <laughs> oh, I did you do this? Is right. Okay, that's right. I'm just going through because all of the things people have moved around. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Caroline. I've done Caroline. Okay, Maria, Maria, Maria. Oh. <laughs> We've got exile to north and then we're up to renewal. And what would renewal be talking about? When say renewal, <clears throat> renew the covenant. That's exactly, yes, that's right. Yes, renew so, the covenant. So we're talking um, about um, the, the, the southern kingdom of Judah. Ah. Um, saw what happened to the northern oh, kingdom and thought we better follow God because we don't want to get invaded like they did. And they came back to God with some of the godly kings and they celebrated the Passover and did all the good things. Um, but it wasn't enough and eventually we have exile of the south, which is where we're up to now with Jeremiah. But when did they find the um, when did they find the law, the book of law? Yes, that's in, this, that's in this section here, in this renewal section. So yeah. Um, he, some of the good kings like Hezekiah and Jehoshaphat, they come along, Jehoshaphat I think was eight years old and they found the law in the temple and they said, this is important. We better do something about this. And so they came back to God and they celebrated the Passover and did all this good stuff. Um, but it was, it, was, it was only a partial return because then the next king comes along and abandons it again and goes back to idol worship. So eventually the exile of the south is what we're talking about. That's when Judah um, was invaded by Babylon. So Assyria invaded the north and Babylon invaded the south and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in 586 BC. So that's pretty important. Um, the last thing on the timeline is restoration. And that's when the Israelites who've been exiled come back. So that's the, that's the next thing on the list. We'll, we'll get to that soon. So Jeremiah lived in the time after the exile of the north 
and now up until and including when the south was invaded. So he was there on the ground when Babylon invaded Jerusalem. Eyewitness of all of that. Um, okay, we're going to look at a passage in Jeremiah. Here's the background on Jeremiah. He was the son of a priest from the Benjamites. He lived in Anathoth, which was close to Jerusalem. He was a young man, possibly maybe a teenager, because he had a he was around for quite a few years as a prophet, so he must have um, been quite young when he started. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at, oh, we're going to read, who I'm going to read, who's going to read? Uh, Tavi, you can read this for us. Everyone open your Bibles to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, chapter, four to, chapter 1, verse 4 to 10, please. Chapter, chapter one. 1 of Jeremiah, verse yeah. 4 to 10. And Matt, you can show in chapter 1, 17 to 19. That'd be good. Yep. So Jeremiah chapter, chapter 1, one verse 4 to 10. Yep. Um, I'm reading NLT. Okay, so um, yep. The Lord gave me this message I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. O oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you, some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. Awesome. So this is, sounds like Jeremiah's first encounter with the Lord. And he's cause very similar in a lot of ways to Isaiah's first encounter. You know, that angel of the Lord reaches out and touches his mouth again. So it's quite similar. You'll notice um, some of the things that are quite significant for us. Before I formed you in the room, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. This, of course, is one of the favourite scriptures of people that are against abortion because it's talking about people being pre-existent, God knowing them, calling them before they're even born. Um, and this is one of those passages that inspires us to protect unborn children. Um, Alas, Sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. We hear, obviously, echoes of Moses and probably of most other people as well. What are you doing, God, calling me? I don't know how to do it. Seems to be the standard qualification. For God to do something amazing with your life, the first thing you have to do, I can't do that. It can't be me, right? Um, and then we have the instruction from God. You've got to do whatever I command you. Um, it's very clear that he's the example of obedience when the rest of the nation is not obedient. Uh, so he's obedient. He must do everything God commands him. Do not be afraid, for I am with you, and I will rescue you. Very um, clear promise that God is with Jeremiah to save him and to rescue him from whatever is going to happen. Um, he's called a prophet to the nations. And interesting, verse 10, he's appointed over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down and to build and plant. So he's not just a prophet to Israel, but he's actually, God is using him and his ministry for world politics mm -hmm. um, to influence nations in all of the known world through his prophetic ministry, which is a powerful thing, right? It's, he's not a a small level prophet at all, the significance of his ministry is very, very strong. Um, so let's look at <clears throat> um, Matt. We're continuing on the same episode with Jeremiah and encountering Jesus, encountering God. Um, verse 17 to 19, what have we yep. got there? Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever. Oh, sorry, just had a my bowels just jump. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you, do not be terrified. Uh, by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but I uh, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and uh, and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Now this is a great introduction to what's going to happen in this book. Very he, he talks in another part how God's going to make him an iron um, wall to stand up against them. There's 
throughout the book is opposition, opposition, opposition. And basically, Jeremiah, just do what God says and God will be with you. Otherwise, it'll be bad, right? Don't be scared of them. You should be more scared of God than of them. This is basically the message. And he's made um, Jeremiah into an iron pillar and a bronze wall to push against the whole land and to resist the whole land against, again, you see the kings and the officials and the priests and all the people. It's definitely a push against leadership. And through the whole book, we see the leaders fighting against Jeremiah. And we see the people coming. He gets a lot of persecution and stuff. And this is all planted right at the very start when he gets going. So that's a good introduction to what's going to happen in the book and what is going to be on. Let's have a look at who's next, Sheila. How about you read for us chapter 36 of Jeremiah, verse 1 to 4. This is a great example of what goes on in Jeremiah's life. 36, 1 to 4. Um, in the fourth year of Je uh, whatever that name is, Something, son yeah. of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. To which verse? Uh, one to four. Um, perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster, I plan to inflict on them. They will each turn from their wicked ways when I forgive their wickedness and their sin. So Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Baruch wrote them on the scroll. Awesome. Okay. So what's that? I'm very clear what's happening. So this obviously is a part of a history. So Jeremiah has his, his prophetic bits and then some narrative stuck in the middle. God tells him to write down all of his prophecies on a scroll. He calls Barak, who's his, his scribe assistant. Barak writes it all down. Um, the rest of the story goes something like, Go and Barak, Jeremiah's already been like under house arrest. He's not allowed to go out. So he's not allowed to go to the temple because he's been causing too much trouble. So Barak gets to go to the temple and read out some of the prophecies to the people, the people and the priests and everything. And Barak gets taken before the king. And they, they say, what is this you're reading? And he shows them the scroll. And so they read the scroll to the king. And the elders of Judah are saying, we should repent. The scroll is a prophecy that, We've forsaken God, and the king's not very impressed. He cuts up the scroll, puts it in a fire. Um, so Jeremiah and Barak have to go and hide um, because the king wants to lock them up, put them in jail. Um, and so we see the resistance of the of the leadership, the king especially, not listening to Jeremiah. Um, it's interesting, the whole thing about him writing down his prophecies. So what happens is Jer Jeremiah writes it down again, adds some more. Um, and so the, the team thing here with his, having a scribe to help him gives us a bit of insight into how prophets acted and what they did in those days. Um, so that was uh, <clears throat> following on after that. So that was Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, who was the king at the time. At, at this time, Jerusalem was sort of under the control of Egypt because his father, Josiah, had been defeated in battle by the king of Egypt. Um, and Josiah was the one who was cleaning out Jerusalem and getting rid of all the idols and stuff like that. And when he got defeated in battle, then the idols came back. And so from this time on, as there's a serious decline, Jehoiakim is probably he dies, and then another next king after that is the one that actually goes into exile. So um, this is the sort of idea of what's happening in Jeremiah's life. We'll look at some more of the important passages that... Give us a look at what's going on. So here's the outline of the book. We've got God calling Jeremiah. We've looked at that. A description of how bad things are, Jeremiah's conflict. Um, so here's some passages for everyone to find. I will start with um, Ian. He's back. Jeremiah 17, 19 to 27. And uh, Ben, 26, 7 to 16. Uh, Shemitai 31, 31 to 34. Uh, Maria chapter 7, verse 11 of Jeremiah. And Kumar chapter 11, verse 19. So you guys will get all those. 
and um, we'll go through them. Who's got chapter 17? Hey. Yeah, let's have it. Right. Keeping the Sabbath holy. This is what the Lord said to me. Go and stand at the gate of the people through which the kings of Judah go in and out. Stand also at all the other gates of Jerusalem. Say to them, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and all people of Judah and everyone living in Jerusalem who come through these gates. This is what the Lord says. Be careful not to carry a load on the Sabbath day or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. Yep, do not bring a load out of your houses or do any work on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your forefathers. Yet they did not listen or pay attention. They were stiff necked. Hello, hang on just a tick. I'm just on a Zoom. Uh, and would not listen or respond to discipline. But if you're careful to obey me, declares the Lord, and bring no load through the gates of this city on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy by not doing any work on it, <coughs> then the kings <coughs> who sit on David's <laughs> throne will come through the gates of this city with their officials. They had they and their officials will come riding in chariots and on horses, accompanied by the men of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, and this city will be inhabited forever. People will come from the towns of Judah and the villages around Jerusalem, from the territory of Benjamin and the western foothills, from the hill country and Negev, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings, incense and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. But if you do not obey me, do not obey me to keep the Sabbath day holy by not carrying any load as you come through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day then I will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gates of Jerusalem that will consume her fortresses. Awesome. So there's a passage from Jeremiah. Um, now, let's have a little talk about what is it about? What's going on? Tell me some of your observations from that well, Jeremiah 17, that little encounter, that the prophetic word that Jeremiah has brought to the people. Who's talking yes. about it? Yes, yes. What was that? Keeping the Sabbath holy. Keeping the Sabbath holy. That's what about that? So, um, so it's a in, in one way, it's a simple formula. There's a commandment part of the old covenant that people are not doing, and he's calling them back to um, fulfil that condition of their covenant. What else do you see in that? Um, some other things you might see in that passage. It's very interesting the number of times he talks about gates, right? You can yeah. see the way that the prophet spoke. He, um, God, God says to him, go and stand by the gate, okay, which we know that the gate was an important place in the city in those days because it was the only way in and out of town and crowds would be there and that's where the business and all of that. So he's at a very central point. But then he basically prophesies about the gate, right? He says, if you bring stuff through the gate, you'll be in trouble and then there'll be fire in the gate. And if you obey God, then kings will come through the gate and people with sacrifices will come through the gate and the gates will be blessed if you obey God and the gates will have trouble if you don't obey God. So he ties this whole prophetic word to the gate. Obviously trying to make something that people will remember using what images he can and stuff like that. And yes, the key thing was they weren't keeping the Sabbath. Um, you'll notice he says these are a stiff, I told this to your ancestors and they didn't obey me. They are stiff-necked people. Very common thing for Jeremiah to say. Um, what will happen to the people if they obey? What will, what will be the result of them obeying and keeping the Sabbath? What are blessings? They will be blessed. There's a specific blessing. Um, he says, if you obey me, declares the Lord, and you don't carry your loads through the gate on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath holy, then what will happen? Will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gate. Oh, yes. That's, yeah, that's what you don't. Oh, if you don't know by me, that's what will happen. There'll be a fire in the gates of Jerusalem. That'll burn down the whole thing. Right, that's a bad thing. If you do obey me, then... There'll be no fire? <laughs> there will be no fire, that's right. Um, who sit on David's throne will come through the gates. So descendants of yeah. David, which was the promise, descendants of David will come through the gates, okay? And officials and will come riding on horses and men of Judah. The city Jerusalem will be inhabited forever. So short answer, the covenant promise that David's 
um, sun will rule and that people will bless the Jerusalem. That'll come true if you obey this command to keep the Sabbath. Um, Jesus, if not, Jesus came on a donkey. Jesus did come on a donkey through the gate, right? There were horses, yeah. Yeah, um, but he didn't, didn't come on horses. There was a thing because yeah. this it talked about horses. Interesting. Uh, horses were signs of strength, you know, military mm -hmm. leaders. Yeah, your strong military leader doesn't go ride a donkey. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not that's that's the controversial thing about Jesus, but because um, he came to serve. But mm -hmm. so yeah, so there's this whole the whole things very clear formula. This is the problem. If you obey me, all these good things will happen, and if you don't obey me, all these bad things will happen. Um, and in this case, he's using the gate as an example to try and get people to understand what he's talking about. So that's um, very standard prophecy that he would, um, that Jeremiah would give. A simple sin that they need to deal with and a promise of blessing if they deal with it. Okay, what's the next one? Jeremiah 26. 26, who had that? I had, I had 26, 7 to 16. Yeah, go for it. Okay. The priests, the prophets, and all the people listened to Jeremiah as he spoke in front of the Lord's temple. But when Jeremiah had finished his message, saying everything the Lord had told him to say, the priests and prophets and all the people at the temple mobbed him. Kill him, they shouted. What right do they have to prophesy in the Lord's name that his, that his temple will be destroyed like Shalom? What, what do you mean, saying that Jerusalem will be destroyed and left with no inhabitants? And all the people threatened him as he stood in front of the temple. When the officials of Judah heard what was happening, they rushed over from the, from the palace and sat down at the new gate of the temple to hold court. The priests and prophets presented their accusations to the officials and the people. This man should die, they said. You have heard with your own ears what a traitor he is, for he has prophesied against this city. Then, then Jeremiah spoke to his officials and the people in, in his own defense. The Lord sent me to prophesy against this temple, this city, he said. The Lord gave me every word that I have spoken. But if you stop your sinning and begin to obey the Lord your God, he will change his mind about this disaster that he has announced against you. As for me, I am in your hands. Do with me as you, as you best think. But if you kill me, rest assured that you will be killing an innocent man. The responsibility for such a deed will lie on you on this city uh, and on every person living in it for it is guy, absolutely right? true <laughs> yeah. it is absolutely true that the lord sent me to speak every word that i have heard then the officials and the people said to the priests and the prophet this man does not deserve the death sentence for he has spoken to us in the name of the lord our god then some of the wise old men stood and spoke to all the people, assuring they, assuring them, they said, "Remember when Malachi of Somewhere. Mom, yeah. yep, something, prophesied during the reign of King Hazar of Judah. He told the people of Judah." Yeah. So, so this is another example of what's going on in Jerusalem at the time. Um, he, Jeremiah's coming up there saying, "God is going to judge the world, all that stuff," and. The peace. So the false prophets and the priests in the temple um, try and get him killed. Um, this time around, some of the elders and the people say, hold on a minute. I remember last time this happened, someone prophesied in the name of the Lord, and it, that was for, guy was from God, and that king didn't kill him. They responded. They repented. We should do the same. And so his life is spared at that time. But people were basically accusing him of treason. You see, they called him a traitor because... They're all, most of the time, half of the time, they're surrounded by enemies, like under siege. And when you're under siege, anyone who's um, like spreading, discouraging, discouraging the, the morale of the army is a bad thing, right? If you're under siege, you're surrounded by armies, and someone says, oh, the king of Babylon's going to win. We're all going to lose, and we're all going to die, and all our families are going to be killed. That's not exactly inspiring your army to stay firm and strong and loyal. 
So mm. that's the reason he was getting in a lot of trouble because he was undermining the morale of the country and everything like that. He's basically siding with the invading armies, um, which is not a good thing to do. And so that was his problem. But of course, again, he's very clear, if you repent, God will sort this out and fix the problem, but it's only if you will come back to God. Okay, then we move on um, to the book of comfort. About halfway through the book, it changes over, and he starts prophesying comfort to Jerusalem. So we've got Jeremiah 31. I don't know who had Jeremiah 31. That was me. That was you. 31 and 31. Yeah. But everyone shall die for his own. Sorry. Behold, the days come, says the Lord that I'll make a new covenant to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the, hand of e out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was, an, I was an husband to them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I'll put my law in their inner parts and write it in their hearts and will be there and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for, that, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So that says, these, is that it? Yeah, yeah that's it. That's it. Yes, thus says the Lord. That's right. So this is a very famous passage, New Testament believers, of course. We see here a prophecy of the new covenant. It's like new covenant, new covenant, new covenant, new covenant. Through that thing, God is going to make a new covenant, even though that the people have not kept the old one. He's going to make a new one, and it's going to be different to the old one. They broke the old one, even though I was a husband to them, and we see the common image throughout the prophets. God is the husband, and the people of Israel are the unfaithful wife that keeps abandoning him. That's the, the big me the message that he has. Um, he's going to write his law in their minds and put it on their hearts. Um, this is the new covenant rather than being an external one where people have to tell you what to do. You know because you've got it on the inside. And we see in that a New Testament thing. You know, the spirit within is what's guiding us. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Um, they were assuming, if those people would have been assuming that that would be because they would respond to God and offer the sacrifices and keep the Sabbath and God would forgive them. But we see through that more of the promise of Jesus, obviously. We have full forgiveness um, and cleansing of sin comes not through the things they were doing, but through a whole new new covenant. So um, this is the turning point, one of the turning points in the book of Jeremiah, when now he's comforting and promising good for, Jer for Jerusalem, even though they haven't actually repented yet or anything like that. We have some other important parts. Let's look at... What else have we got? Verse... So verse 7, 11 um, and eleven nineteen is a couple of passages. Oh, there's a lot of Jeremiah in the New Testament. So 7, 11, let's uh, Maria, have you got 7, 11? 7, yes. Yes, verse 11, chapter 7, verse 11. Yes, okay. Has this house which bear my name become a den of robber to you? But I have been watching declare the Lord. Yes, yeah, so obviously there's a New Testament link there. What's the New Testament link in that passage? Anyone remember? Uh, Jesus, when he tossed Mark. the leaves out. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Point. Jesus said, my house will be called House of Prayer. You have made a den of robbers. So he quoted this passage. Um, Mark 11, yes. 17. And Mark 11, that would be what Jesus said. He quoted, he said, this is, you've made this place a den of robbers. Mm -hmm. um, interesting understanding of it. He was saying in this passage to the people, do you people, do you people despise the temple like it's a den of robbers? I'm still looking after the temple. That's what God was saying. But Jesus just picked up the den of robbers part and applied it in a New Testament way. Um, the other one is 1119. 1119. Who's got, got that? It. Yeah. All right. I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not realize that they had plotted against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree and its fruit. Yes, yeah, so cut him off from the land of living, that his name be remembered no more. Okay, so that also has a New Testament connotation. The lamb to the slaughter phrase, this is where it comes from. Um, okay. Jeremiah's people were plotting to kill Jeremiah, and the Holy Spirit warned them about it. God told them. And he says, You know, I was like a lamb to the slaughter, I was just walking along. And if God hadn't shown me, they would have killed me. But God rescued him 
and lambs as a slaughter became a phrase that Jesus picked up as well and was used. Um, and there's lots of Jeremiah in the book of Revelation. Just saying, um, have a, if you want to look through Revelation, you'll see lots of references to Jeremiah. I want to look at one passage in detail, or a couple actually. It's so good. I want someone to read chapter 18, 1 to 12. Um, we're going to look at the potter's house story. You've probably heard the story of the potter's house. Let's actually read it, see what it's about. Ta -ta -ta -ta. Who fancies a good read? Might be Gloria, I reckon. <coughs> you good to go, Gloria? Yeah. Chapter 18. This is, the message, this is the message that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house. I will give you my message there. So I went down to the potter's house and saw him working with clay at the wheel. He was making a pot from clay, but there was something wrong with the pot. So the potter used that clay to make another pot. With his hands, he shaped the pot the way he wanted it to be. Then this message from the Lord came to me. Family of Israel, you know that I can do the same thing with you. You are like the clay in the potter's hands, and I am the potter. This message so what does it mean, interruption, what does it mean God says, you are the clay and I'm the potter. We've heard that phrase. How many people have heard that phrase? Mm. We are clay in the hands of the potter, right? What does it mean? He can do whatever he wants with us. He can, he, shape can, how he, he can shape you however he wants, right? So our responsibility is to have a, obey him, right? Okay, keep going, Gloria. There may come a time when I will speak about a nation or a kingdom that I will pull up by its roots or tear down and destroy it. But if the people of that nation change their hearts and lives and stop doing evil things, I will change my mind and not bring it on them, the disaster I had planned. There may come another time where I speak about a nation that I will build up or plant. But if I see that nation doing evil things and not obeying me, I will think again about the good things I had planned to do for them. So Jeremiah, say to the people of Judah and those who live in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. I am the potter preparing troubles for you and making plans against you. So stop doing the evil things you are doing. Sorry, I just lost my thing. Uh, each person must change and start doing good. But the people of Judah will answer, we don't care what you say. We will continue to do what we want. We will do the evil our stubborn hearts want. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much. So what's the passage about? What do we think the, the um, things about? Where's, where's, so where does God speak to Jeremiah? Potter's house. At the potter's house. So what is the potter's house? What do we think the potter's house might represent? It's a workshop, what is it? maybe, yeah. It's a workshop. So you could say a secular business, right? Okay, as where is God speaking? It's also, again, it's the place of shaping, the place of forming, maybe, but yes. So um, a secular workplace is an interesting place for you to get a, re a prophetic message from God. Okay, what, who is the, so in the story, who is the potter? God. God is the potter, yes. Who is the clay? Um. <laughs> all of us. Yeah. All of us. Okay, his will we'll start. The people, the clay is right. The people of Jerusalem, right? He says, "Oh, God says oh, I am the what I'm the potter. The, the clay is the people." Um, what's the key moment? Remember, in parables, there's normally a key moment. There's a punchline. What's the key moment punchline in the story? When the potter um, changes the um, broken into something else. Yes, exactly right. So the key moment in the story is the guy is making something. He doesn't like it, so he squishes all back down and starts again and makes something else. That's mm -hmm. the key moment in the story. And then God says, "That Israel, I am the potter, and you are the clay. I'm going to do that." What is he? What is he saying? What's the main point of this prophetic message? So he's going to destroy what is and then rebuild again. Start again. Mm. Um, yes, I, think, I, think, I yes. think he's alluding to the New Testament a little bit there, but saying that potentially, well, what was exclusive, I can make it not exclusive anymore. Uh, mm, I, I, I wouldn't have seen that myself in there. So, go doing them, us and me, stick, stick totally in 600, 700 BC. What is he talking about? So, he's um, they are the clay and he is the potter. And he's making something, 
and then just going to change it and make something else. What is the application of that moment? The exile, the people are about to be exiled. Uh, yes, yes. So I'm thinking that the, the thing that's not working is the people that are sinning. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. So when people are sinning, that's the pot I don't like. I'm the potter, I'm making a pot, and I don't like it because of sin. So what do I do if I don't like the pot? Start again. Squash it I start, start again. again. Okay, and now what's the application? The ex because there's a big explanation in the middle of what he's actually what is he actually talking about. So the explanation in the middle is God says, starting about verse seven, if I announce that a nation or kingdom is going to be destroyed, right? Mm -hmm. I might change mm -hmm. my mind. Okay, like the potter changed his mind, and I might not destroy it. I might bless it instead, right? And if I decide that I'm going to bless someone, a nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's all nation level, remember? We like to personalize, but first think about nations. I decide I'm going to bless a nation, but then I don't like what I'm seeing in that nation. Oh, I'll squish it and I'll destroy it instead and I'll do something else. So, the point of this whole clay pot of thing in this passage is that God's going to might change his mind. That the prophecy that he has made, I prophesied over Jerusalem blessing and prosperity and kingdom rule and all that wonderful thing, but. I could change my mind. I will reconsider the good that I was going to do if I don't like the way it's turning out. Okay, so just as the potter goes, ah, I don't like this jug. I think I'll make a plate squish. Okay, the same way I was making Jerusalem, but I'm not liking what I'm seeing. I'm going to curse it instead of blessing it. Right, and I was, I had, and likewise, I pronounced judgment, say, over Nineveh. Right, think about the story of Jonah. God has pronounced judgment over Nineveh. And then the people repent and God says, okay, judgment cancelled. Okay, so this is a, the main point is that when God speaks over, in this case, over a nation, the result, blessing or judgment is not guaranteed. There's still an option for you to turn judgment to blessing if you repent of your sin. And you can turn blessing into judgment if you start sinning. So, okay, so this is, the, we, do you see, I hope you're seeing that in the story, right? clay squish the clay so it's not really in this case it's not really about us being obedient and willing and god's shaping and he's making it's whether he likes what he's getting that is the actual thing and whether he's going to continue or whether he's going to change his, change his mind okay so that's the um thing now so that was talking about remember god is talking about nations in this in this passage so we could 20 21st century this whole thing give me a possible 21st century analysis or exit thing that might come out of this story. Now that I understand what it's about and I'm living in the 21st century, what's a possible 21st century parallel? Hypothetically speaking. You can't use that. Oh, that's terrible. So it's, it's a pretty uh, close to heart one, Derek, but um, yes. coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> Like, him not to say this, but he's persisting. So. How does it, how does this match? Yes, I was, I was actually just having this conversation with Soph. I go in our human minds, we go, God, God's a nice God, and He doesn't do anything. But if we look at like the Tower of Babel, and you know, He got frustrated at um, building, yeah, trying to reach the heavens. Uh, you know, so it's He does actually use scenarios in the Bible where he, if He's not happy with something, He'll um, He'll change the scenario. Oh, totally. So, so the coronavirus you're saying might be an example of God changing his mind. And he, so what we're merely looking for is God changing his mind from blessing to cursing or cursing to blessing. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what we're really looking for. Um, because this is what the story is about. God has declared something and then he changes his mind and does the opposite based on the behavior of the people in the middle. Okay. So we've got Australia and yeah. Australia is, uh, we've, got the curve happening because we got a prime minister that's praying for our nation okay yes oh, good yes well, possibly possibly so there's there was judgment coming over australia but the people have responded in prayer and the virus has been held at bay yeah yeah you can that's Back. one that's a that's a completely valid interpretation of the um of this passage um it would have fitted better if there'd been a mass turning to god of the people but um, a, a, a Christian prime minister that's praying for the country is a really good start, and one person can stand in the gap for a nation. So, yeah, he, okay. They were, they were in, um, isn't it? They were all in the House of Parliament or wherever. Forgive me, and they were praying. Mm -hmm. 
Possibly. This Possibly. is an amazing thing. Yes, this, so this good, right. My husband told me, and I'm just going, praise God, you yeah. know. It's so good, yeah. right? All the ideas of let's get rid of the prayer out of the out of Parliament, maybe we've forgotten that we even said that now, maybe. Hopefully. Okay, another example. Flip it the other way. Another mm -hmm. example, hypothetical example of um, the application of this principle that we see in the story in the 21st century. I don't know if I'm on the right track. I guess for me, I'm thinking of um, because we are the jar, our bodies carry the spirit of God. Therefore, as as people think of our bodies as the jar, the clay jar. And so we really need to um, live a life that is godly, that God likes. So in order for his spirit to live in us. Yes, yes. That's very New Testament and very Second Corinthians or whatever. But that's the principle that we're looking at in Jeremiah, which is where this passage is. Yeah. God pronounces through prophetic word a declaration of blessing. Then, because the people he's talking about are sinning, he changes his mind and brings judgment. Okay? Or God pronounces judgment, but the people repent, so he brings blessing. Okay? So now we're, and it's talking about nations in particular. So now we're thinking about a 21st century application of that principle that God decides to bless a nation and changes his mind. God decides to curse a nation and changes his mind. So you mean it's up to us to come to Christ and ask repent of our sin and then he can bless us is that what you mean i don't um, know well i'm what i'm saying is okay i'm saying here's an example australia great south land of the holy spirit right how many people have heard that <laughs> prophetic declaration over australia right in very very early days blah, blah 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 is that guaranteed money in the bank that australia will be the great south land of the holy spirit no right. according to this anything. passage according to this passage there's no guarantee it'll actually happen because it's dependent on whether the people in Australia respond to God or not. Absolutely. Because as God has said, great South land of the Holy Spirit, but if the clay isn't suitable and isn't responsive, he might change his mind and say, poor South land of desert waste. Okay. Just because it's dependent on the response of the people in the middle. The clay can, can talk God out of blessing or the clay can talk God out of judgment. Okay. Now let's put this on a personal level. Okay, that's a nation level, personal level. Corey Turner comes and gives a prophetic word over your business or over your ministry. What does that mean? Is it money in the bank? No. no. It's, not, it's not money in the bank, right? Okay, Corey Turner comes and says, um, prophesies over Cedar Point College. This is, this is a hypothetical situation. Okay, 400 students over five campuses throughout Australia. Okay, wow, great prophetic. How exciting. Does that mean, what does that mean for us? What's our response to that? Be encouraged. Encouragement and work and obedience right. and diligence and follow God with all of your heart, right? Because it's not, oh, well, God said, God said, so therefore I can just do what I like and it's going to happen. Okay, because God has said it, but he could change his mind if the people running the college are slack and stop praying and stop fasting and don't read their Bibles anymore because they think they've been told it's going to be wonderful. Then suddenly he can change his mind and say, "Center point, what? Okay, this is the um, this is the message of this pro of this prophecy was people of Jerusalem. Just because God told Abraham he was going to bless you, it's not money in the bank unless you are faithful, like Abraham was faithful. So this is the um, that's the meaning of the Potter's House parable, right? How awesome is that? Now <clears throat> I've got another one just because I can, just because I can." I want us to look at, we'll just really quickly, how many people know Jeremiah 29 11? <laughs> Someone tell me Jeremiah 29 11. Yeah. What is it? Another plan path for you. Who said that? I didn't, Caroline, was that? No, Jimmy. I know the plans That's I have for you, says the Lord. Prosper. Yeah. Prosper. <laughs> and to prosper you. Yeah. Have to give and not you to harm you, right? Yeah. Give your future and hope. Okay, everyone knows this, right? Someone's feeling down and depressed. We think 29 11. God has no plans, hands for you, plans to prosper, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Okay, amen. Great, encouraging memory verse. Now, does anyone have any clue what it's actually about in Jeremiah? Because it comes from Jeremiah 29 11. Okay, so let's have someone. Oh, I'll read it because we want to be quick because we're a little bit out of time. But um, Jeremiah 29, I'll read this to you. This is the text of the letter. 
that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests and the prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried off into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Okay, so that's verse one. That gives us some context. So Jeremiah is where? Where's Jeremiah? In exile. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem. The letter that Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the elders among the exiles and the priests and the prophets. So Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon invaded and took a whole lot of people away. Basically all the rich educated people got exiled to Babylon with Daniel and all his mates, right? Jeremiah is still in Jerusalem. He writes a letter to the people who are living in Babylon. Okay, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I'm starting at verse four. To those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry, have sons and daughters and find wives for your sons. Give your sons, give your daughters in marriage so they can have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty God of Israel says Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams they encourage you to have, the dreams you are encouraging them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. What are the false prophets saying that Jeremiah is warning them about? This is interesting. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and I'll fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Okay, there's Jeremiah 29. Now, what's the point of Jeremiah 29? This prophetic letter that Jeremiah sent to the people. What was the point? For I know the plan I had for you. Yes. Okay, what was, the, what was Jeremiah telling the people in Babylon to do? He was telling them that even though they're living in exile in Babylon, just stay there, wait on the Lord and trust mm -hmm. in him, Ex have more children, settle, make gardens, do whatever. Yeah. But be faithful and wait patiently for God because in 70 years, which is a very long time, he, will, he, he will then deliver them from captivity. And right. so... They're in an awful place, but they're given this, just stay there and be happy. That's exactly right. Okay, so they're in an awful place. They're refugees in another country. What do they want to do? Go home. Go home to Jerusalem. What are the false prophets telling them? The lie is that God has not sinned. <laughs> that God's going to take them home. God is going to send you back to Jerusalem. You know, okay, <laughs> Jerusalem, we will be this time next year, you will stand on the gate wall of Jerusalem and praise God or whatever they're saying, right? The false prophets are saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, God will send us back. Babylon will fall, you know, um, blah, 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 blah. Don't, don't be established here because God is going to deliver us. Da, 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 da. And God is saying, no, it's all wrong. 70 years, I have great plans for you and in 70 years, I will bring you back. So, Think about who is going to go back to Jerusalem. The next, the next generation. generation. Totally, the next generation. Yeah. If you're listening to this letter, God is not talking to you, right? Yeah. Because you're not, you're going to be too old in 70 <laughs> years' time to walk thousands of miles back to Jerusalem. Okay? You're not going to see it. Okay? This tells us some things about God, and it tells us some things about the promise, right? He is saying to these people, what you want the miracle that you want is going to come to the next generation. So when God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, there's a generational you right there. Mm. When God right. gives you a prophetic word of encouragement, it's a generational prophetic word. You no. can't be sure that it's going to be you this week. It could be you, grandchild. Right? Same thing to God, okay? So God says to you, Pastor Joel, Center Point Church will have campuses throughout the world. It will become highly influenced, blah, blah, whatever. Okay, I haven't heard any rumor of that, but God says, right? Seven countries, Center Point Church in seven countries, okay, and you will spread to the blah, blah, blah. Great prophetic word. Joel gets all excited. Joel's 65 and we're still in Perth. What does he think? 
has God failed? It's a generational promise, brother. Come on, right? Don't, don't be disappointed if your promise that you got five years ago hasn't come to pass yet. Because God's a generational God, right? And when he sees you, he sees you, he sees your children, he sees the generations that come after you. When he sees center point, he sees center point now, and he sees center point in 100 years' time, and the Shalaya family don't even attend anymore, maybe, who knows, right? It's not just one person. It's a generational future. God sees the city forever, right? It's totally different. We see this promise. I know the plans I have for you, and we think me, 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 right here, right now. <laughs> I'm stuck in something that I don't like. I'm in a job I don't like. I'm in a, um, a situation that I don't like. My health is what I don't like. And God says, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you, give you hope in the future. That could be for me right now, or it could be for my descendants. Or the, those that come after me, it could be I'm part of something much bigger than just myself. Okay, and God does have plans for promise and future, but some of those plans, there's no guarantee you're going to see them because these people here, their job was to work hard at what God had given them right now. Okay, because in 70 years' time, there had to be children and grandchildren, rich and prosperous, ready to make that trip. Okay, they weren't ready, they were refugees who just come as poor, naked, um, straggled survivors out of an invasion. They had nothing. They had 70 years to grow their families, grow their prosperity, become rich and powerful so that they could go back to Jerusalem strong. It feels so, so God, much like we're back in the wilderness. Totally. For them, that's exactly what they thought. They would have thought, we're back in the wilderness. We, we've been, we're no longer in the promised land. Every covenant and everything God has promised us is gone. And God says, right there is where you need to be, okay? Prosper where you are. Work hard at what you've got right now. Stop dreaming about someday, one day, maybe something nice will happen. Prosper where you are now so that when I open the door, you'll be ready. Because when God opened the door in 70 years, he didn't want a group of straggling refugees. He wanted rich, strong, powerful multitudes to make that trip back. And so the prophecy is... Wherever you are right now, don't keep looking for one day maybe God will do a miracle and get me out of this, but prosper here because my future plans require you to prosper now so you're ready when I open the door. Powerful, powerful. So much in, the, in that verse when we see the whole story, when we get the whole idea and we realize, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. It doesn't, it's, I'm just the start. There's so many more. And my job right now is to do the very best with what I've got. So that when God opens the door, I'm ready. So if God's, for example, the reason most people probably do Bible college is they think that there might be a call on their life to do something one day. Okay. And it's too late when Pastor Joel rings you up and says, I want you to take over a campus, right? It's almost too late then to think, well, I should probably read my Bible. Okay. No, 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 no. Come on. You should have done this. You should have been through college. Okay. Even when you're in the job you didn't like. Okay, even when you had no future and nowhere to go, okay, that's the time to do college so that when the door opens in seven years or seven weeks or seven months or whatever the time frame God has set that we don't know, when it opens, we're ready. We're strong, we're well equipped, we're prospered in the place that God had us, and so that we can take the abundance with us when we make that trip into the fullness of what we all think is the answer, the solution we want to be. Praise God. That's a good passage. That's great stuff out of Jeremiah. There's a whole lot more, right? Um, dun, 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 dun. We've just done that, and we love that. Um, the <clears throat> we're going to stop. We're not going to look at Lamentations, unfortunately, because we've run out of time. Lamentations is probably written by Jeremiah as well. He lived through the destruction of Jerusalem, and he wrote lament songs about it. The main thing to note is they talked about how bad it was. It's all our fault. We've sinned. And God's judged us, and he should have, um, and that's it. Oh, God, and there's not even a, we're sorry, God, we repent. There's not even a, please, God, have mercy. There's none of that. It's just God is right. He is just, he is holy. We are bad. Um, there's a real ownership of our own fault. There's a real, it's a real grieving, a lament thing. It's a grieving thing. It's an expression of grief. The only thing that it does do, he does do, is he says, God, if you could um, look at us in our state, because Smart Jeremiah knows that if God looks at you for very long, he'll have compassion and mercy, right? So look at us is all I need to say because we know that what God will do when he looks at us for a long time. Talking about um, literary structure just for a minute because we're not talking about lamentations, right? Okay, 
there are they are called acrostic poems. So each verse, each chapter is 22 verses. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Each verse starts with a subsequent letter of the alphabet. So the first verse starts with an A, the second verse starts with a B, the third verse starts with a C, all the way through the Hebrew alphabet. Okay? And that's how they work, that's how they work. So there's a structure to them, it's not just random, except for the last chapter, which just doesn't. Now, in Hebrew, um, I'm going to point at my screen and you can't see it, but there's a triangle thing, arrow, right? <coughs> in Hebrew poetry and literature, the middle is the climax. When you watch a movie and you read a story, we waffle on for the first three quarters and we build slowly, build up, and we have the climax right at the end, and then you have 30 seconds of resolution and wrap up, and that's a finish. That's how we do stories. Jerusalem, Israel, Hebrew poetry, Hebrew literature, the middle is the main point. Okay, so the middle of Lamentations is the main point. Okay, the middle of the book of um, Ruth is the main point. The middle of the book of Esther is the main point. So, and a lot of their things you will see, they'll balance in the book of Jonah. The stuff that happens at the start and the finish. And then the start, same things happen in the middle. The middle is the main point. So Lamentations is one of those. Where the middle is the main point, chapter three is three times as long as chapter one and chapter two, in chapter four and chapter five. It's the main point. And we see in there some of the key verses about um, God's faith, great is your faithfulness, your mercy is new every morning, that sort of stuff. Um, in that book. Um, and that's Lamentations. It's awesome. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. We're not going to do any of this because we haven't got time. But we will do. Oh, um, I've just broken it. Um, we will have a short break. And during this short break, you will get a text from Sophia with a scripture verse in it from Philippians. You need to keep that verse because I'm going to ask you to read it in our Philippians session, which will start at 8 10. Awesome. <laughs> and that'll give me four minutes to fix whatever I've done to my PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> 